QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Sales receipt, payment received at point of sale. Let's do it with Intuit's QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in QuickBooks Desktop. Get Great Guitars practice file. We started up in a prior presentation going through the setup process we do every time. Maximizing the home page in the view drop down. Noting we got the hide icon bar. Open windows list checked off. Open windows open on the left hand side. Going to the reports drop down. Company and financial. Opening up the profit and loss range into the change in 010123 to 123 January to December 2023. Customizing the report, fonts and numbers, changing the font. Let's bring it up to 14 this time. We're gonna we're gonna level it up a notch and say, okay, is that okay? Yes, it looks good. It looks good. Reports drop down. Let's do it again. Go into the company and financial this time, the balance sheet report. And then let's go to the customizing, then range and changing 01012312312123, January to December, fonts and numbers, change in the size. Let's bring it up to 12 or 14. 14, that's it. Okay, so there it is. Prior presentations, we set up the new company file. We went through transactions, typical for financing the company, such as putting money in from our own account, possibly taking a loan out to finance the purchase of the things we need to generate revenue, such as property, planting equipment, and in our case, inventory. And then we finally got around to making some sales. So in the prior presentation, we're gonna to go to the home page. We made some sales with an invoice. An invoice is an accrual process where we make the sale or do the work before we get paid. Then we went through the receive payment meaning then we got paid by a check or, or cash or some point in the future. And then we had three received payments that we're gonna then put into the bank at some point as a deposit. Before we do so, however, we now wanna go from an accrual standpoint and a flu accrual flow within the customer or revenue or sales cycle to that of a, of a cash flow basis, in which case we would use a sales receipt. Now note, you might be in some situations where you're gonna go right to the deposit form in order to record a sale. That would be in a very kind of simplified accounting system. And the simplified accounting system would only work if you're in certain types of industries. So for example, if you have the gig work kind of situation, you're getting paid by a platform, YouTube's paying you or something like that. Well, then you can wait till it clears the bank and then you can use bank feeds possibly or simply a deposit form to record the increase to the the bank account and record the other side to sales or revenue income at that point in time. However, you do lose some of the sub ledger capabilities to run sub ledger reports by by customer and sub ledger reports by item. But that may well be worth it in those specific situations. However, if you have more complex situations such as you're making sales at a cash register, like a restaurant or a food truck or a, a store of some kind, or if you have a job cost kind of system, which is like a bookkeeping company, landscaping or whatever, you have to do the work beforehand, bill the client and then collect at some point in the future, then you'll have to go to the invoice. So the most complex kind of system is typically gonna be an accrual system, because then you have to deal with the receivable. That's the one we looked at last time with an invoice, receive payment, then a deposit. Then we have a cash-based system, one which QuickBooks is still designed to do a full service accounting system, even though on a cashed basis, possibly with a register in the store, like in our department store for our guitars. 
then we were gonna be using the sales receipt type of form. And then the easiest method would be a step further in ease from a cashed based system to one which you're just waiting till things clear the bank and recording the transactions there possibly with the use of bank feeds. That's not exactly what QuickBooks is designed to do, but you can work that way and it would be easier if you're in a specific type of industry to be able to do so. So now we're gonna imagine that we're like in our store and we're, we're, we're making sales in our store for guitars. Someone's gonna bring the guitar up to the register. And because we have everything set up properly, including our items and our sales tax and everything, it's gonna be really easy for anybody that we're gonna hire to kind of calculate the sale, determine how much we need to be collecting on it. So let's go into that. We're gonna just say, create a sales receipt. And let's say this is coming from String Music. This is a new customer. So I could get there by going to new customer this way. I often just type it in here, String Music. I'm gonna say String Music is our new customer. And then tab, it's gonna ask if we want to add it. Oftentimes we might want to go to a more complex setup if we plan on giving them our newsletter or shipping the, the guitars to them or something like that. Uh, we possibly want their phone number for future reference and whatnot, but I'm gonna do just a quick ad right now so that we have the minimum information, which is just the name, which in some cases, if you're at like a restaurant or something, your customers probably don't want to, if you're doing a food truck, <laughs> the customers don't want you to collect their whole life history, you know, as you're trying to buy a, a taco or something or a sandwich, right? So in any case, it's gonna go into undeposited funds. That's the default. Note the same setting that we looked at last time with the invoice, uh, with the payment receipt is here. So in other words, if I go to the edit preferences and we go to the payments and I go to the company preferences, that is checked off by default. And if it is, you won't see this option here and you also won't receive it in the receive payment area. The reason it's under the payment area and not the sales receipt area is because that kind of covers both bases because uh, at this point in time, you're still receiving the payment at the same point in time that you're making the sale. So I'm gonna close that back out. We have the same kind of options. We might then choose depositing directly into the checking account from here instead of going to the clearing account of undeposited funds. But if you're collecting at a register, it's more likely that you're gonna to wanna to use the undeposited funds even then if you're, if you're using a, the full accrual system because it's likely you're gonna get paid in cash or credit card payments of some kind here. And both of those are most likely not gonna be going into your bank account on a one by one sales basis, but rather be grouped together the cash then being grouped together with all the cash we collect in the day that we will then deposit in the bank in one lump sum, the credit cards being grouped together by the credit card company that then is gonna deposit them into our bank in some kind of grouping method, which we have to determine, we want to figure out so that we can make our deposits to match what's gonna be on those, those payments because that's gonna make our reconciliation process as easy as possible. So we're gonna keep it going into undeposited funds here, which is the default. And then we're gonna say, I'm just gonna keep it on cash. We have the same kind of payment options. These differences, cash versus check versus uh, credit card, doesn't have a material impact or any impact on the actual transaction that's gonna impact our financial statements, meaning the impact on the financial statements, balance sheet and income statement, but give us a good reference tool to help us to sort the transactions by different methods. So I'm gonna keep it uh, on cash here for our purposes. We're gonna then say this happened on the 19th, let's say 119.23, sales number sold to. We don't need any address or anything because we're selling it in the shop, although we might wanna collect it if we could. And then we've got our item. So we're gonna say we sold an ELP, ELP tab. Because the item is set up, it's easy to populate. If they bring that guitar up to the cash register, I should be able to identify it even if I don't understand items and how they're set up or how this is gonna impact the financial statement. I should still be able to do my job of collecting the money, recording the transaction. I'm gonna say we got three of these. So 500 times three is 1,500. And then we're also gonna sell a G, a GSB, which is a Gibson SG, we're saying one of those at 777. So there is that. 
So there's the transaction tax is applying. The tax is applying automatically because we turned on the sales tax in the same way as with the invoice. And we set up, we set up the grouping that needs to apply here. The items are taxable items. Therefore the tax is being applied thusly. All right, so what's gonna be the transaction when we record this? What's gonna happen? Well, it's a sales receipt. That means instead of accounts receivable going up, it's gonna to go to some kind of cash account, in this case, undeposited funds, which is not a checking account, it's in other current assets, but it still represents an increase in cash, in essence. We could put it to the checking account, but we're going to undeposited funds. That's gonna be for the full amount, 2390.85. The other side is gonna look a lot like the invoice. It's gonna be going to revenue, driven by the account specified by the item, to, to the revenue accounts, but not including the sales tax, then the sales tax is not gonna hit the income statement because the tax theory, theoretically is imposed on the customer. We're just the collection agent, so it shouldn't be recorded as income. We also shouldn't have a sales tax expense. We're just gonna record it on the balance sheet. It's a non-income item increase in the liability of the 11385. We're also gonna have a decrease to inventory for amounts not shown on the sales receipt because we don't want to show this to the customer if we're going to give them the actual sales receipt as in essence a receipt but the system knows what the cost is because we put that in place when we made the items in the item list then the other side is going to go to cost to get sold which is in essence an expense account which will be recording the expense of the use of the inventory that we needed in order to generate the revenue and we're also going to have the sub ledger of inventory impacted counting the quantity of inventory that's still going to be on hand okay let's save it close it check it out save it close it check it out go to the balance sheet we've got the undeposited funds so here's undeposited funds we've got a lot of cash we're holding on to so we better go to the, to the store before we're robbed there's the 2390 if i double click on that there's the 2390 full amount including sales tax closing this out closing the other side the other side is on the profit and loss going into the sales double clicking on sales there it's in their same sales receipt two line items because we sold two different types of items but that's going to be for the amount not including the tax so you can see those items don't include the tax closing this out the tax then is going to be on the balance sheet under the sales tax payable double clicking on that it's in here with these two line items once again because now we're paying the state and the the city even though it was taxed at the same five percent four percent for one one percent for the other is the way we broke it out which we made up for the practice problem and then inventory so inventory up top double clicking on the inventory we could see it's going down with the sales receipts and if i double click on the inventory so there is it if I look at the inventory account, notice it went up with a check. It often goes up with a bill uh, as well if we purchase in that format. And then it goes down when we sell stuff. The sell stuff forms are invoices and sales receipts. So I'm gonna close this back out. And then the other side is on the profit and loss. So a lot going on with the sales receipt if inventory is involved as well as, as, well as sales tax. Cost of goods sold, there's the cost of goods sold. Note that these amounts here are not actually on the sales receipt because, hold on a sec, these amounts right here, 1,200 for example, not on the sales receipt because we don't want to report it on the sales receipt in case we give that to the client as a receipt, but the system knows about it because of the way we set the items up. Closing this back out and closing this back out, back to the balance sheet. The other thing to look at is the, the uh, inventory here, sub ledger, reports drop down we're going to go to the inventory inventory valuation summary let's go up and customize it and change the dates from 010123 to 123123 fonts and numbers let's bring that up to 12 and see if that'll work or if that's too many too much for this report in terms of the columns it's still good it's still good i can see i could just widen these out a bit and so there now we're adding up to the 38878 here are the inventory items that remain that should match what's on our balance sheet which it does so that looks good also 
if I go to the home page, this deposit form represents four items now that are have gone through undeposited funds, three of them with the received payment, one of them with the sales receipt, we're representing all of them in cash so we can show the concept of us putting them together possibly, which we won't do yet. But in theory, if I went to the bank with one lump sum deposit of $22,890.85, that's how I want it to show in the cash account on our side so the bank reconciliation will be as easy as possible. But I'm not gonna do that now, closing it out, closing it out. Ultra base, one more time we go here. Let's do another one. We're gonna make another sales receipt. We're imagining someone's in our store. They come up to the cash register with all these guitars and we're like, okay, that's a sales receipt, not an invoice because they're gonna pay me here and now. Sales receipt, this is gonna be for a new customer. I'm gonna type in Sam the Guitar Man, the Guitar Man. And notice you might be in an industry where they were like you're at a food truck and they don't they don't want to give you your name all the time. So you might have like a generic name, which would be your this is your customers and you might record all the sales under that one customer if you're not collecting this kind of data from your individual customers in terms of you know who they are in order to record the sales still possibly. Any case, we're gonna say Sam the guitar man. And I'm just gonna do a quick ad. If if I wanted to collect more data, like their address, their shipping address their their uh, phone number then i would have to do a more indent setup here but i'm just going to do a quick ad for now it's going to go into undeposited funds i'm going to say it's cash just for the convenience of us being able to think about grouping cash in the same format as it would be deposited which we have a problem with because if it was a check then it's going to hit the bank in that same format as one check in which case we might want to use the checking or we could at least do that and we wouldn't have a grouping problem between our books and the bank account but even then it's useful to have just one method going into undeposited funds and that means that all deposits or all increases in the checking account will be deposit forms or possibly transfer forms but we won't have these other forms like a sales receipt or payment form as an increase which can be a little bit easier when you're drilling down that way as well but in any case tabbing through we're gonna say that this they brought up to the register a, a a service item. So now we've got some service items we're gonna do. So we're gonna say that they came into the shop and they asked for a diagnostic. Now, what is a diagnostic on a guitar? That sounds like a car kind of term. I think, yeah, it kind of was, I think at the start. So we kind of just made some service items because I wanna show the difference between the service items and the, and the difference between the recording of a service item versus the inventory item. So, Bear with me on the types of service items we set up. Hourly service item one, pretty generic. You probably want to have a better service item name than hourly service item one, but that's what we have. We did hourly service on someone's guitar. We like sanded it or something, I don't know. And so then the next one's going to be tuning. We got tuning support, which is quite expensive. <laughs> I'll tune your guitar for way less than that. But then there's 12. Okay, so that's our services. The thing we want to point out with the services here is that one, you would like to set up your service items in such a way that the billing process is as easy as possible. For example, if you're a bookkeeper, you might not want to do just an hourly service item, but rather see if you can group your, 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 your uh, billing on some other thing, like how many transactions you put in place. That can be a little bit more concrete. It's actually a little bit easier to do the billing in some way, because then you're not always worried about how on point you were in terms of how much hours or time you put in place that varies from one job to another, right? So in any case, we have that. Also note that it's not taxable. The, in, the system knows it's not taxable because we set up these service items as non-taxable items. So the item is the thing that's telling QuickBooks whether it's subject to tax. In this case, we're talking sales tax. So you can see no sales tax is being applied down here. What's gonna be the transaction when we would record this? It's a sale. So it's still gonna be uh, increasing some kind of cash account, in this case, undeposited funds. The other side is gonna go to a sales account but, or an income account, but probably not the same one, probably not sales. It might go to like service income. It'll be driven and knows where to go by the items that we set up. And then we don't have to deal with sales tax. We don't have to deal with inventory on the balance sheet. We don't have to deal with the subledger of inventory and we don't have to deal with the cost of goods sold. So a much more simplified transaction when we don't have inventory, when we don't have sales tax. 
Let's check it out. Let's save it and close it. And I'm just going to say tuning. I misspelled tuning. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, okay. So now we got another item in the deposit. Apologize for the spelling. And we're going to go to the balance sheet. And so now we've got here in uh, undeposited funds. It has increased. We got $28,070.85 that we're holding on to for some reason because we're crazy. But we got we to gotta make a deposit. Man, this is not safe. I don't feel secure. I'm going to close this back out. And so close this back out. So there we have that. The other side is going to the profit and loss. So now it went into income, but the item told us to put it into service income. This is the major kind of categorization separations that we typically want to see on the income statement, like the broad categories, meaning sales represents inventory we're selling, service items represents service items that we're doing. Notice what we did not do is make another income account for every kind of guitar we sold or another service account for every kind of service we performed because if you have a full service accounting system, you can run other reports to give you that detail. So for example, if I go to the reports up top and I can see the sales, sales by, I can see sales by customer, for example, from 010123 to 123, which gives us that added detail, the 15,257 uh, going over here to the 15,257. I can run a report, reports drop down, sales, sales by uh sales by item summary making it from 010123 to 123123 and that's going to give us our sales by service items inventory items totaling up at the 15287 profit loss uh, 15287 now if you start posting stuff to sales for something other than using the invoices and the sales receipts your sub ledgers can can get out of whack like if you record deposits directly to a sales account, revenue account, income account, then those sub reports don't work as well. So if you're using gig work, that's what you, that's some of the detail you, you lose. That's those sub accounts. So those are the pros and cons there. But if I go into the sales account here, we see the sales receipts. So notice they broke out all three items, even though it's the same sales receipt because we had three separate items within the sales receipt, closing that out. And then of course we have, we don't have to deal with the sales tax. We don't have to deal with the inventory. We don't have to deal with cost of goods sold. So now we still got this huge amount in undeposited funds, which is represented over here in the homepage in future presentations. We will make a deposit. We don't want to do it yet. I want to hit, I want that five. Look at it's red. I have to do something about it. It's red, but in the future, we'll click them off here and group them in the same format as we will be seen on the bank statement making the reconciliation easy not yet though not yet wait wait for for more gratification in the future we're going to go down and let's open up the trial balance and just check our numbers now we're going to say this is from 010123 to 123. let's customize this thing fonts and numbers change the font let's bring it on up to 16 16 yes please okay and just see if, if your numbers tie out here, great. If something is off, you might wanna change your date range. And, and, uh, and that's often an error that is there. If you see some date that's wrong or some amount that is off, you can double click on the account, go down to the source document. You can change the source document, something you wanna be very careful of in practice, but QuickBooks does allow you to make those kind of changes and they're great to do in a practice problem like this.